Speaking of searches, Google processes approximately 99,000 search queries every second. This translates to 8.5 billion searches per day and approximately 2 trillion global searches per year. So in 2023, just last year, YouTube was the most searched keyword on Google with over 340 million monthly online searches. The second most popular, popular search was Facebook with 238 million monthly searches. The third was Pornhub. Approximately 189 million searches monthly. Additionally, the keyword weather ranked fourth with 147 million searches monthly. Now the top Google searches in 2023. Here's number one. Is Rihanna pregnant? <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, I was watching the Super Bowl and girlfriend came out. I was like, she looked bloated. She I ain't like, I don't know what's going on with that fit, but that was definitely the most Google thing. Damar Hamlin came in second. Remember that football player that collapsed, had cardiac arrest right on the field? The game was postponed and fans held vigils all across North America. It seemed like even atheists were praying for him to be restored and thankfully he was now what i find weird is number 64 was chick-fil-a how jesus's favorite chicken gonna be number 64 it's gotta be higher on the list everybody i mean it is manna from heaven people i know y'all got a lot of chick-fil-a's down here but new york is just starting to get up there taylor swift also was one of the top 100 keywords searched last year. 6.9 million searches, probably related to her record-breaking Eras tour. Any Swifties in the house? I'm pretty sure there are. She was overshadowed quickly, though, by Diddy. But now that the video's out, we know he didn't do it. He definitely did it. If you were wondering, did he do it? He did it, all right? So it, <laughs> that's savage. I'm going to keep moving on. Pray, pray for me. Here's the funny thing. In April of this year, the most Googled phrase was, where is my refund? <laughs> April, everybody's coming for Uncle Sam. Like, man, vacation's going to hit different. Here's something that I've wondered, and maybe you've seen this guy on the internet a couple of times and wondered, how old is Hezbollah? Yeah. Have you ever seen this guy? <laughs> Everybody wonders how old he is. Now, now. I have a confession. I have four older sisters. My youngest sister to me is 10 years older than me. So I grew up like an only child. And so when you're an only child, you got to make yourself laugh. You got to amuse yourself a whole lot. And I'm 49 years old. I'm still making myself laugh. All right. I got to, y'all can pray for me. Stretch your hands forward. That's, a, I'm going to need that kind of prayer. So I do something very frequently to make myself laugh. I will get on Google and I'll type in questions and I'll watch what it auto populates to see what it auto-completes because it tells me what people are searching for all around the world. And it's hilarious. You can put in the wildest things and get some fascinating feedback like this. Who would win a fight between, and this is what comes up, Batman or Superman, a taco and grilled cheese, Hulk and Wolverine, Batman and Iron Man. Look at this one. Why does my husband look at other women Blame me for everything. Lie and fart so much. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, we are in house of God today. Don't do what you do at home. Here's an odd one. Why isn't 11 pronounced one to one? I just thought <laughs> people are searching this all over the world. I'm a pastor, so a lot of times I'll just type in something like, help, I'm a pastor, and look what comes up. I'm a parent, I'm a pastor's wife, I'm a prisoner in the library, I'm a prisoner in a Chinese bakery. Hello, I don't know why that is something that people are Googling. This is so crazy. Now look at this one. What does it mean? So what does it mean? What does it mean when you dream about snakes? What does it mean when your poop floats? People want to... <laughs> people want to know. One of the questions that people ask is, what does it mean to be a Christian? 
Because we're all searching for something. More often than not, we're searching for something to satisfy us. Why are we happy one moment and then depressed in another? Why are we people that go on endless searches to fulfill ourselves? We're searching for significance. We are searching for answers. We are searching to be loved. We're searching for affirmation and attention. Some of us are searching for soulmates, and that's the only reason why you got your edges snatched before you came here today. <laughs> got them tight because you may meet somebody. We search for it through the allure of money by supplying our egos with whatever it wants. And today, a lot of us know the agony of coming up empty after our pursuits. And I didn't get to mention this to you, but one of the most searched things in the world, one of the most queried things for all humans is, could God be dead? And for many of us, we may be asking that in a variety of ways, because if God wasn't dead, then why is my life going in the direction and the trajectory that it's on right now? And for those of us that are followers of Jesus, we ask this question a lot. And if you're here today and you're kicking the tires of your faith and you're not sure where you land spiritually, I want to let you know you can breathe out a little bit because the closest followers of Jesus struggled with the answer to this question and they were searching for it just like many of us, regardless of our nationality and our beliefs, we search for it. So all four Gospels that are included in the Bible's New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the story of Jesus' death, his burial, and his subsequent resurrection. And today we're going to go to a text that most of the time we only go to during Easter. But we're going to the writings of Luke, who was a doctor that wrote down the ministry and the teachings and the life of Jesus so that modern audiences like you and I could learn from those words and have certainty that Jesus Jesus can help us through anything that we're going through. And he wrote this to a dude named Theophilus to prove the certainty of who God was. And he takes us to Sunday morning, two days after Jesus had been crucified and buried. And during that time, the Jewish people were under the oppression of the Roman government. And they wanted societal upheaval. They wanted to be the people in power so that they could stick it to the man. And they thought that Jesus, their Messiah, was going to be able to do that. But here they are, depressed and down because Jesus had been crucified like a criminal. Think about how traumatized they were on that day. Just earlier, Jesus is sentenced to death and then they watch him die. And then they know that he was crucified in part by the betrayal of one of their close friends who sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. They thought that they were going to be a part of a movement, but now they are public enemy number one. And so we go to the first verse where it's described in detail. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. Now, Jesus had prophesied that he was going to rise again, but they're coming with products for his burial. They had no belief that everything that he said was going to come to pass. And they found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. We have to toggle to the other gospels to learn that these are actually angels. And the women were terrified, and they bowed with their faces to the ground. And the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? I think it's a powerful question to ask Hope City because I think we're still doing the same thing. Why are we looking among the dead for living things? So many of us, whether we live in the city or the suburbs, are searching for things that belong in a cemetery. And I can tell you that the angels were pointing to something and Jesus is pointing to something to us today through the scriptures. It is our misguided search for life and fulfillment in all the wrong places. How many of us know the feeling of being ridiculed younger in our lives only to be on a search to find fulfillment and affirmation through our academic and our career pursuits today? How many times have we looked at a website to try to escape the pain of what we're feeling today only to have the deadness of voyeurism leave us empty again? Again, think about how many times we've shopped at the mall trying to buy another logo and blazing thing, another bag, another pair of shoes to hide the insecurities that we feel so somebody can just affirm that we look good. How much have we felt the ache of loneliness from time to time after a short-lived lover left us after one more hookup? Do there, is there anybody in this house that understands the numbness of what it feels like that drove you to the bottom of one more glass of whiskey, Merlot, or scotch 
only to find that you're further away from God and further away from the hope that you were intending to find. How many of us are going to take one more vacation somewhere overseas, post it on Facebook, and only get four likes? You went to Monaco and nobody's leaving any comments. We try to turn down the volume of our loneliness in our lives with relationships. Is this the reason why some of us are helicopter parents schlepping our kids all across Houston to all different types of events, trying to live vicariously through your kids instead of finding life in yourself? We're searching. I feel like preaching in this house today. Why are we always looking for the living amongst the dead? I'm not saying caring for your kids, having pets or purchasing clothing or seeking solace in relationships is bad. I'm just trying to let you know that we're not going to find life in all of those things until we find life in Jesus Christ first. And if there's anything that unites us all in this room today, this diverse bouquet of nationalities, there's something that unites all of us in this place. And I'll tell you what it is. We are all on the search for something and we're all trying to avoid something. It's called death. None of us want to find ourselves in that position. Is this the reason why many of us have heard of Brian Johnson, the 46-year-old multi-millionaire tech entrepreneur who is spending most of his fortune trying to avoid one thing, dying. He's already spent $4 million on a life extension system called Blueprint. Blueprint's goal is for him to achieve immortality. He outsources every decision related to his body to a team of doctors every day. Think about this. He downs 111 pills every day. He has a cap that shoots infrared light into his scalp so he doesn't lose his hair. Some of us are like, oh, I'm going to Google that right now. I'm about to search for that right now. (laughs) Johnson thinks any act that accelerates aging, like eating a cookie or getting less than eight hours of sleep, is an act of violence. And this 46-year-old man that we just looked at circulates and transfuses the blood of his 18-year-old son in his body so that he can trick his organs that they're actually younger than what his DNA is telling him. Dude, my Jamaican grandmother, (laughs) she lived to 92 years old. Girlfriend only ate jerk chicken, oxtail, rice on peas, beef patties, and drank ginger ale. If you went to my grandmother and said, Grandma, I got stage four cancer, she'd be like, you drink any ginger ale? (laughs) Grandma, I got leukemia. Oh, you just need some ginger ale. And she lived. This guy weighs himself every few hours. He does everything he can to prevent wrinkles. And in a recent Time Magazine interview, he said most people assume that death is inevitable. But we are now living in a time where it may not be so. He has started a movement called the Don't Die Movement. And could it be that we are just like him, trying to preserve ourselves with our own ability, trying to make sure that we can protect ourselves and trying to make sure that we can get other things to make us live longer? We are self-preservationists. This is why the global anti-aging market was valued at around $62 billion in 2021 and is expected to go to $93 billion in 2027. And you know who's driving it mostly? Men! Dudes! Trying their best to live forever. Listen to me. I know that black don't crack, but it creases, Okay. So listen to me. I I, I believe in fitness. I believe we should exercise, eat as healthy as we can, sleep well, drink well. A lot of ginger ale, in fact. But the place to get immortality is not in our genes. The place to get it is in Jesus Christ. I feel like preaching now. Listen, we keep searching for it in every place, but it's not in your bank account. It's not at the mall. It's not in another relationship. If you want to live forever, it's going to take somebody to say, I'm not searching for it. It went, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I wish I had 10 people that understood that if you want to find life and find it more abundantly, it's not on social media. It's not, hey, it's fine. In Jesus. Oh, okay, I feel comfortable now. (laughs) Listen, listen to me. 
He is the most religious person you know of because he's doing everything he can to preserve his own life. Some of us are doing the same thing, and that's why the angels declared he isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. <laughs> Sometimes I got to read the Bible like that. What had happened? Okay. <laughs> so let's get it practical real quick. Well, that's why we got to remember and return. You can't remember to this text and return to this text only on April in Easter. Every day, ooh, I feel like preaching. Every day, my God, I feel like preaching. Every day we need to go to the resurrection text because there's so much stuff trying to hold us down and hold us back. So much stuff that's trying to make us feel like we can't rise above. Ladies and gentlemen in Hope City, you might have lost power at your house, but if you got the Holy Spirit inside of you, you're not losing power. If God's inside of you, there's nothing that can hold you down. Your divorce can't hold you down. Your trauma can't hold you down. Your pain can't hold you down. Your depression won't hold you down long. But you got to believe that you got resurrection power inside of you that'll make you move. You're not hearing me because right now, if you felt that was true, some of us would be up on our feet saying, you ain't holding me down. My power may be gone at my house, but God is in this house. Kevin Hart got saved. Amen. So <laughs> <laughs> It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened, what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. Can we start listening to the ladies, guys? Can we just, hello. They always got it right. So let me give you practical application number two. This is how you interact with this and put it in your Monday. You gotta look in and lower yourself. Look into the story and lower yourself. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. So the scripture is telling us something that's archaeological, but it also has an inference to our lives that we need to stoop. We need to get lower. We need to peer in again to the resurrection power in the empty tomb that is available to us beyond Easter Sunday because too many of us don't realize that we are buoyant by the power of God that is resident in our lives, that you cannot be knocked down and knocked out if death couldn't knock out Jesus. What you're going through right now is not going to knock you out. I don't care how long you've been in it. I don't care how severe it feels. I don't care how intense it is. God is inside of those who have put their faith in him and you're not going down. And the truth is we're all searching for something today. And what you're searching for, you will inevitably find. All of us. In social media, algorithms are rules and signals and data that govern a platform's operation. So in other words, these algorithms determine how Content is filtered, ranked, and displayed before us, and it influences our choices. So what we see on social media is often because of what we have searched for. Have you ever been looking for a pair of New Balance on a website, and then all of a sudden you get on Instagram? What do you see? Just a ton of ads. <laughs> Sometimes I don't even want to talk around my friends because Siri is just recording everything. I'm like, ha, man, Siri, you need to stop. This is scary. Because what we search for, the algorithm determines that we need to either see more of it or it tries to enti entice us with more. Ladies and gentlemen in this house, spiritually speaking, what our hearts search for sends signals out to the evil one, the enemy of our soul. And sometimes we have things that we're searching for in our heart and then all of a sudden the enemy weaponizes what we're searching for and it starts presenting. You want to know why you keep dating the same deadbeat? 
because you sent out an algorithm by the choice that you made searching for something and now the enemy keeps showing you all the wrong you want to know why you keep attracting toxic people it's because you search for somebody that didn't belong in your life kept them there and now the enemy can listen I'm in this house today to get some people to change the algorithm God is trying to get you to stop attracting the wrong things and attract more grace attract Attract more mercy, attract more hope, attract more peace. We got to change the algorithm. So here's a question. What would our spiritual explore page look like and reveal about our hearts today? Would you be embarrassed? Would you be ashamed for people to see your proverbial explore page for the things that you've shopped for? I have to be honest, there's been times in my life I was searching for so much affirmation from my friends, from my peers, from my colleagues, that I started getting the wrong people in my life that affirmed the wrong things about me instead of calling things out of me. They just allowed me to be, ah, oh, you're not here. They allowed me to be, and I got locked off to the things that I should have been open to. But there's something about God that I love. <laughs> that when you search for him, he'll change the algorithm as well. Oh yeah, those, those disciples, they were so cowardly, they were locked up in a room by themselves, they were shook, all scurred, all insecure. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in the room, peace be unto you. They're like, ah! Jesus, what you doing in here? The door is locked. How'd you get? Listen to me. I want to encourage somebody in this house today. Some of us think that we've locked off ourselves so much that God can't get in. But Jesus shows up even in locked off place. If you search for him. He'll show up in your marriage that you feel like he's locked out of. He'll show up in your job, in your career, in your academic pursuits. In ac Listen to me. There's not a place that you can lock off that if you've ever searched for Jesus, that he won't show up. Somebody shout yes. Yeah. The resurrection is the most powerful historic event. It is God's greatest advertisement for his love for humanity. And the empty tomb is God's receipt that Jesus paid it all. Because God knows that we've searched and we are continuing to search for a lot of things, places and people that were too embarrassed to admit. And sometimes a lot of us want to do something that we could do on Google to make our lives clean. Let's be honest, husbands. If some of us allowed our wives to see our phones and they search through our history, you'd be serving in singles ministry next week. <laughs> Somebody say, ouch. <sighs> But some of us, we go directly to the wrong things that we search on the internet. But how many of us in our hearts sometimes have considered, how do I commit suicide in the most least painful way? I know when I hit my 40s and I had my midlife crisis and I was just so depressed, wondering why my life wasn't further ahead, I would think about those ideations from time to time. Thank God the Lord just saved my life with the right people around me and changed the algorithm. Listen to me. We think about... How can I go on living after I've lost a loved one? How do I tell my wife I'm unsure that I'm still in love with you? Some of us are saying, how do I cover the cuts on my body that I make on myself because I don't know how to release any pain in my life? Is there a way that I can stop my anxiety without overusing alcohol or a medication? Some of us are searching for things we've never told anybody. And guess what we try to do? We try to do it just like Google. You know the Google option where you can clear your history. Yeah, there it goes. Sometimes you can go on there and you can clear your browsing data for the last hour, the last 24 hours, the last four weeks, or all time. And that's a beautiful function because every one of us wants to get rid of the shame and the pain and the trauma that we've had in our life. But can I tell you, God is greater than Google. Because Google may be able to clear your history, but it can't clear your conscience. Google may be able to clear what you've done, but it can't change what you are going to do again. And the reason why I love God is that he will clear the history of what you've done today, what you'll ever do tomorrow, what you'll do next week by the blood and the power of Jesus.
Jesus Christ. There is no one greater than our God who is able through the blood of his son to cleanse, redeem, wash, renew our lives. That's why the scripture says, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Because the truth of the matter is we're all living lives that could lead to the wrong way. And God wants all of us to lead lives that go toward him where there is eternal life. It's why I love the story of this dude named Carlos at our church back home. Carlos was a drug dealer with sell drugs and even use drugs, came to our church, put his faith in Christ, and now we baptize him just about a month, a couple months ago. Yeah. Carlos isn't using drugs. He's clean and he's leading our facilities team, cleaning up the church because he's like, God, clean me up. I want to clean his house up. And that's what can happen for all of us. Look, we're all searching for something. And I can tell you there's times where I'm on the internet and something will pop up because I've been on the internet for a while. And it'll say, do you want to continue as you? And I'm like, yeah, I've been me for 49 years, dog. What do you mean? Yeah, well, it's asking me, do I want to stay in the profile that I'm logged into? And it gives me some other options. It says you can use another account or remove an account. You know what I'm trying to get some of us to do today? Too many of us have been logged into depression and it's time to change your account. Too many of us have been logged into our sorrow and God has sent you on this Sunday to encourage you, to tell you to log out of yourself and log into his son for you to log out of your depression and log into some joy. I wish I had about 15 worshipers that would realize I've been stuck in my own profile for too long. I've been in my head trying to work everything out on my own, but today I'm logging out of me and logging I get into life. I'm logging out of my habit and into my happiness. I'm logging into Christ. And I'm telling you today, a lot of us need a profile change. Oh yeah, we do. We've been logged in for too long, surfing as ourselves. And I can tell you, it only leads to a life that's not fulfilling. And so when we log into Christ, we log into the transferred righteousness of Jesus. And when the father looks at us, he's like, oh, you good. <laughs> you're, you're good. Listen, I, I have God's favorite phone, an iPhone. And uh, <laughs> don't you dare judge me and look at me like that. I rebuke you green people in Jesus' name. <laughs> hey! I come against you green people. People in Jesus' name, I come against you right now, Samsung user, in the name of Jesus. God's phone is the iPhone. I come against you WhatsApp users too, that are too cheap to get a regular. So that means I also use God's favorite computer, an Apple computer. You can hate me later. And so I have one of these dudes on my team at my church. I'm always searching for stuff on the internet. I'm always looking at all, all different types of stuff, right? And I got one of these nerds on my team. He's a great guy. You know, he's always like... <laughs> knows how to write all this code and stuff crazy, right? And man, sometimes my computer just stops working. And one of these days recently, my computer was just so slow. I couldn't send any emails. I couldn't do anything. So I said, Nate, I need your help. So then Nate comes walking in. You know, he's like, no. <laughs> what do you need? I said, this laptop ain't working. I need you to help me fix it. He goes, well, have you turned it off recently? And I'm like, no, it's an apple. Silly, you ain't got to turn it off. Just close the top. He opens it up, and then he goes, I think you can't send any emails because you have 96 windows open. <laughs> and I'm like, so I'm shopping. I got, I got stuff that I, I got to go back to. And he, he's like, hey, when you have this many windows open, it sucks the power from your battery. You can't use the full potential of your computer if you're searching for too many things. You 
want to know why some of you don't have the power that you want spiritually? You're searching for too much stuff in every other place besides Jesus Christ. You want it in Oprah. You want it in Lululemon. You want it in your gin. And Jesus is saying, yeah, 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 yeah. if you're going to get power, you got to close some windows. You got to shut out all the options. You got to quit thinking about going to another church. You got to quit thinking about getting in another marriage. You got to think... You're not hearing me. Some of us in this room have too many windows open. Looking for too many options. And God operates on something else. Total dependency on him. The reason why you may not have the spiritual power you desire right now is because you have too many things you're searching for outside of Christ. And God is trying to reorient your appetite toward him. And too many of us are like, no, I'm going to double click on this. I'm going to double click on that. And we're opening up windows and we're trying to get back to other things, old relationships, old patterns of life, old uh, things that God has been asking us to close out for a long time. But we like the window open because it means we can always go back to it. But the call of discipleship is costly. Which means you're going to have to close. You're going to have to close some windows. See, the problem with too many of us is that we're like fixed rate mortgage Christians. We lock in at one price. And we just stay the same the whole time. Same rate of worship. Same rate of giving. Same rate of serving. Same rate of financial giving. We're just fixed rate mortgage Christians. We're like, I'm good. Some of us, we so cheap. We're refi Christians. We're like, how can I not go to an HC group and still get an anointing? How can I not give and still be a part of the church? How can I not serve? How, how can I serve less but still get everything God? Uh, yesterday's prices is not today's prices, everybody. And let me just say something to you really quick. <laughs> let me say something because we're all searching for something. Even Steve Jobs, who created these amazing products, Walter Isaacson, who was the famed biographer that chronicled the life of Steve Jobs. The legendary Isaacson paraphrased him. He was a famous atheist for many years. And then he started to dabble in Eastern religion. And he told his biographer before he passed away, he said, sometimes I believe in God, sometimes I don't. But ever since I got cancer, I find myself believing a bit more. Because some of us will never change until something dramatic that is hard happens to our lives and so when cancer hit him it started to increase his faith a little bit or at least his hope he said I I hope that all things just don't end and that there is some sort of afterlife he said I don't like the afterlife idea because life shouldn't have an on and off switch it's one of the reasons why if you look at most Apple products, it's very hard to find the on and off button because he would fight with his designers to make sure that there wasn't an on and off button on it because he wanted all of his products to always stay on. Sort of like God. God did not design humanity with an on and off switch. We were supposed to have eternal life And then our first parents, Adam and Eve, jacked it up for us. Now we got to go to work 40 hours a week with people we don't even like. You know what I'm saying? But God has designed humans not to have an on and off switch. This is why he sent his son Jesus, because the resurrection is our permanent on switch. It makes us never turn off. In fact, Jesus told a woman, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live forever, even after dying. Die.
diabetes will take people out. Cancer will take people out. But those who put their faith and trust in Jesus will never be turned off. They might be in this life, but not the one to come. This is why some of us need to celebrate that God has deposited his Holy Spirit in your life. I don't care what you're going through. You ain't never turning off. I don't care how deep the pain is. You're never turning off. I don't care how much trauma you're going through. Single mom, you can make it. Single dad, you can make it. Single young person, you can make it. Person overcoming drugs, you can make it. It's the power of God unto salvation. It's the resurrection inside of you that's gonna allow you. I wish somebody would throw their head back in the air and say, I'm not going down. I've got power. I got power. So think about this. Barna, who studies the behavior patterns of people in North America. I feel like preaching. Now I got two minutes. I got two minutes. Uh, when they studied the behavior patterns of people that are looking for deeper spiritual beliefs, here's what they found. People want inner peace. Now think about this. People also wanted hope. And we are Hope City, aren't we? Be honest. How many of us in this room want some more peace? How many of us in this room feel like I need a little bit of hope? Now I've been talking about a lot of things. Do you want to know what a question mark is? It's an exclamation point that got depressed. It was like, I believe. And after a while, I was like, oh, I don't know if I believe. And here's what God's trying to do. Ooh, I feel like preaching this thing. He's trying to turn some of your question marks that you're searching for and to push you back into an exclamation point of his glory. My God, you've been questioning too much for too long. I wish somebody would make some statements that Jesus is Lord. I wish he makes a statement. I don't got power in my house, but I got power in my mouth. I don't got power in my neighborhood, but I got power in my spirit. I don't got power, but... Woo! And here's the cool thing. Are you ready? This is so cool. This is so cool. This is full of goodness. I've been talking about all the things that we search for. Girl, you with your, girl, your outfit is fitting. Yes. Yeah. Guess what? God is searching for you. We may be searching for stuff that don't look like him, but God is on the search. In fact, the scripture says that he's searching for true worshipers. Oh, I, if God was on the hunt for a true worshiper today, tell me, would he come in your role? Would he come? Because the son of man comes to seek and to save those that are lost. I wish I had some people that are saying, I'm closing the window. I'm closing my options. I'm here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm closing my opportunities. And I'm going to look to the one that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what I, I can ask or think. If you're here today, oh, okay, I'm over. If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, and you know, overflow room, other locations, you know you've been searching for things in different places, but today you're like, I'm closing some windows. Thrust your hand up in the air. You're a follower of Jesus, and you're saying, I'm closing windows. There should be more hands up, unless you're gonna be searching for stuff that ain't gonna fill you. Look at how many followers of Jesus are saying, I need to close some windows. You know why? You're sucking your spiritual battery of power. You're sucking your spiritual battery. So here we are. We're going to close. Let me say some prayers for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, for every person in this room that's raising their hand right now, we're saying, God, we're closing windows and we're giving you the power to do what only you can do in our lives. Would you shape us, make us whole, help us not to keep looking in all the wrong places for you who is the right thing. Breathe upon us with the same breath that called Lazarus on the dead. You are the resurrection and the life. So resurrect the things in us that we thought died. Help us with our habits, our hangups. In the name of Jesus, amen. Everybody say amen like you believe it. Come on, say amen like you close some windows. All right, all right. 
So every head bowed, nobody looking around, this room is full, nobody moving yet. This is the most sacred part of the service. If you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus yet, you would not say you're a Christian. Or you would say, yeah, I kind of believe in God, but you don't really follow Jesus exclusively. This is the time where you get to start a relationship with God. And a bunch of Christians just admitted that, man, we got some flaws, we got some windows that are open that we need to close. And guess what? You need to close the window and lead in your own life and allow yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus. And if you're here today and you're like, man, this message just hit different with me. I know I've been searching for some stuff in all the wrong places, but today I know it's found in God. I want you to raise your hand if you wanna pray a prayer of salvation. We are not gonna call you forward, we're not gonna embarrass you, but look at that, hands are raised right now. Come on, raise those hands high. One, two, three, four, five. Why am I counting? I'm counting so you know that you're not alone, all right? I'm counting so you know you're not alone. Keep those hands up and then everybody's gonna help you pray this prayer. Hope Senior, are you guys gonna help me say this prayer out with everybody so that these people that are coming to faith are gonna feel, all right, are we ready? Father, I've sinned and I'm sorry, but today I make Jesus leader and Lord of my life. I believe he died. I believe he rose again for my sin. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and strength to follow him all my days. In Jesus' name, amen.